Welcome everybody to the Frito and Willie Show. I'm your host, Frito Marcelin, and we got your boy. Hey, hey, we back in here, cuz. <laughs> we back know. in here. Welcome back. You know what I'm saying? We back, you know what I'm saying? We back like we never left. Mm. You mm. know, um, Frito, it's so good to see you, man. Um, to our to to our family out there. You know, uh, hope everything's been going great with you guys, and we very excited to start season two. Season two in the building. You know what I'm saying? And just season two, baby. We ain't going to know well. We just, <laughs> you know, there's a break between the seasons. Season two. Let's go. That's all it is, man. That's all it is, man. Yo, man, you know, this episode, we're going to talk about the Wu-Tang show, man. Getting back into the Wu series. Okay. Yeah. And we're, we're speaking about episode seven, season one, box in hand. I'm going to let you know how ignorant I've been at work lately. This is what I'm going to do, dog. <laughs> like, legit. Just how I've been showing up to work. Hold up. This boy got the Wu-Tang mask. I got three of them, bro. I will show what? another one during the next episode. So oh. I have to go into the office like two or three days a week because of the work I do. Yeah. And um, Yeah. That's how I show up. Yo. With the what Wu. have people in the office been saying? It's been so hilarious because I definitely have got that look. Like, is that some gang paraphernalia look? But then you also get the people that are too excited <laughs> when they see it. That would be me. That you know, be- <laughs> I definitely jumped on the elevator. You know, you jump on the elevator. People like walking. How you doing? And then that person looks once. It looks twice. It's like, is that Wu Tang? <laughs> Definitely had the guy that got on the elevator and saw it, looked back, and before you know it, was like, who take it? There ain't nothing to help with. <laughs> and like, you're looking at them and you like, then the other people in the elevator like clutching pearls and stuff. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's been great. It's been a great conversation starter slash inhibitor of people bothering me. Because definitely have had people be like, you know what? And that food is crazy enough to wear a Wu-Tang. Even, even from even from other underrepresented community representatives, black and brown folk. I never had the black person look at me and be like, oh, for real? Oh, oh this what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> you walking up here Tuesday morning, 7.30 a.m. with the Wu? All right. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, I got throughout. out. I, I brought out the first one, you know, for the for, for episode seven. I'll show you one of the other ones for for, uh, for the next uh, episode of this we do. Yeah. Oh man, that made my day, dude. That made my day. <laughs> it, it it. I mean, the next step is just showing up to work with slacks and Tim's on. You know what I'm saying? That's just the next. Oh step. yeah, yeah. That, that may happen. Yeah, yeah. Stop playing. I don't care. You want me to uh, come into the office? <laughs> this is what you get. I could be doing this at home, but instead, yeah. oh, you Casual me Fridays in. are ridiculous. You just see me showing up with the Jordan Elevens with the woo mask on Fridays. It's really ignorant on Fridays. But yeah. Oh my gosh, yo. Okay, <laughs> I think this episode for me was theme as the Method Man episode. Definitely That's was what the, I think. This was the Takao episode, which basically I, I don't understand the title of the, uh, the episode. Mm-hmm. I know Boxing Hand is an incredible ghost face song that features Method Man and Raekwon from the Iron Man album, but why is this episode not called Bring the Pain? Like, I don't I don't understand why it wasn't called Bring the Pain. Like, it literally would make sense. Like, they're playing lacrosse, People get knocked out. Everything with the uncle. Why is this episode not called Bring the Pain? They but, played Takao 2.0 at the beginning. Yeah. You know yeah, yeah. They easily yeah. could have played Bring the Pain. They yeah, just called this episode Bring the Pain. Like, especially with the lacrosse thing, I don't understand. I'm sure they're probably saving these titles for other episodes, but when the, when the episode started and when you realize this is the, the Shogun Method Man Takao episode, I was like, why is this called Boxing Hand? Because I just knew this would be about Ghostface and maybe Raekwon as well. But, but, you know, oh, I know why it's called Boxing Hand. I'm so slow. It just caught me. Go ahead. I know why it's called Boxing Hand. Sure. They're moving. 
boxes and hangers. Uh, so that was not planned, people. It literally just hit me while it's called boxing. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't. Me. I didn't catch it either. So, so now, that's a good one. Now it makes sense. Okay, now I take back everything uh, I just said. Boxing hand actually does make sense. Go ahead. Oh, right, my turn God. Turn back over to you. Nah, but like, so I forgot that Method Man played lacrosse. You know, mm, yeah. I forgot that. So that brought it to me. But then you see a different side of Method Man. And again, we don't know how much is because they're telling the story and they want to embellish on the story and stuff like that. But you always see Method Man as a pretty jovial guy. I know he's pretty hard. You know, I mean, all of Wu-Tang is pretty hardcore and intense, but Method Man has just always been the feel good, I feel person. The more lighthearted MC out of the group. Exactly, exactly. He's the one that will be busting your chops and not taking things too serious. So when you see this episode, you kind of see a total opposite of that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You see, like, during this, the dude's childhood, being kicked out of his family's home and stuff like that, dealing with a drunk uncle, you know what I mean? You he know, just it, drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I got you, I got you. I got you. But you... I felt kind of connected, not in the sense that I can relate, but it just made me felt feel for your boy even more. You yeah. know what I'm saying? For that Method Man yes. character. You know? Yes. I don't know how it made you feel, but that's for me, that's what resonated for me. Like, damn, Method Man been through a lot and you could see all that stuff being built up to towards the end where he kind of messed up his deal, you know, or trying to get a deal with a manager or the record company. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed this episode uh, because I think I always call, I think like most groups are, 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 are um, clicks with hip hop. There's always that one MC that is a good entry level MC to the click because they're probably going to be a little bit more relatable, a little bit more mainstream for Dipset is Cameron, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. to me. For Dungeon Family is Outcast and, and primarily under 3000. Um, for the Native Tongues, it was Q-Tip. And I think for the Wu-Tang Clan, it was Method Man. And yep. I say what all four of those guys have in common is that they cool enough, um, they... All four of them are really great. I think they throw CeeLo in there as well for Dungeon Fan. They're also uh, people that can walk that mainstream line, that can make the party jam, that can make the jam that the women can get into. And definitely Matthew Man was that guy from the Wolf. He, he still looked grimy, but it was a little <laughs> different grimy than you got grimy, a different grimy than Deck or Jizza or even Ghost and Ray grimy. Like, Method had a, a pretty boy grimy type of thing going on. I mean, he had the first Wu Tang hit for the ladies. He had the first hit, period. Like, Rizzo's plan was to put Method out first because he felt like Method would be the first one. Method got the Def Jam deal. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? So, like, Rizzo knew that Method would be the one to sort of like serve as a launch pad for everybody else. And he and lived up to the hype. Oh, exceeded the hype, in my opinion. Um, especially since you see that Method Man is, I mean, Method Man is, um, is one of the stars on um, Power, uh, Power 2 on Stars. Method Man has been in a variety of films. Um, and then the partnership with Red Man took it to a Cheech and Chong new millennium type of feel. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, Method is no doubt the mainstream star of the Wu-Tang. And definitely. it's not, I don't think it's close. Nah. I mean, none of the Wu-Tang members have done. So he has his rapping skills, which he has, you know what I'm saying? They respect your boy. Oh, but, yeah, 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 yeah. But then he's also able to make movies, do TV shows, and not lose that street credibility. Host, he's hosted stuff. All uh, type has of he hosted stuff? stuff. So what stuff has yeah. he hosted? I think I think he hosted. Um, am I missing? I thought he hosted some type of hip hop show on MTV at one point. If he did, not apologize. But I know I think he did. Like I said, and then the fact that 
Red Man was like the perfect partner for him. The perfect partner. So I I never been to a Red Man Method Man concert. Then you missing out on life, and we need to correct that ASAP. Freedom. So here's the thing, you know, they had the verses, and you're watching it, and you're just like, these two dudes, nearly by themselves, are in, are entertaining the heck out of us right now. They they are. I'm gonna say this, like in my you know top concert experiences, I will be very fair here and say that Outkast has a an incredible bias towards you know so i'll be fair of that mm-hmm. but like right under them are red man and method man like what is it about them when you see the them the energy concert? doesn't stop mm. the energy does not stop um they we're gonna talk about this a lot on the on an upcoming episode but um they have pure chemistry and what i mean by pure chemistry there are people that get on that stage that are part of groups, cliques, whatever, and they're sort of competing, you know, which is fine, right? Because, you know, sword sharpens sword. Right. Red and Meth are competing, but they're also competing to make the show better. Like, they're finishing each other's verses. They're hyping each other up. There are no breaks. When they were younger, they were doing the whole aerial joints and coming down the stage together um there's comedy there is genuine love for each other um and it's just pure unadulterated you guys pay $50 to come see us oh we gonna give you $85 worth (laughs) and think about hip hop a lot of times it'd be too cool for school when you go to concerts I've definitely been to the two cool for school concerts. That is not ready math. They genuinely appreciate that you spent some bread and put on a t-shirt and, and got the Thames or Jordans out to come see them. And they <laughs> will tell you that repeatedly throughout the show. And they mean it. And if there's some type of way for them to greet you or stand outside, they gonna do that too. Wow. Like they they have um they are beyond professional so we need to make that happen for you though <laughs> and i know they're like in their 40s approaching their 50s i saw them oh man that was a little while ago i think i saw them like 10 years ago and i know it's a long time but it, they were incredible i i follow uh, both of them on ig especially red man and you saw their verses, like they still got it. But see, here's the thing. That. I believe you because in the verses, they had no crowd to even work off of. They play off the crowd too. And so if you have a crowd, I know it's gonna give them even more energy. I, I you know, I'm pretty stoked about that. So yeah, man, we definitely gotta make that happen. We'll make that happen, bro. We're gonna make that 2022. Let's we hey, I'm gonna be just sending you concert stuff. Get you. Get your frontier and spirit points up. Let's go. That's a backpack. That's all I'm bringing to the streets. All I'm bringing is a backpack, side. It's all I'm bringing. Oh, oh my gosh. So, man, also in this episode, we start to get the record label management talk. You know, uh, I see your head just. My man sl- selling furs, huh? son. <laughs> fur man. I heard about the cat that sold cars that had dealership, you know, that, 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 you know but I, fur is interesting. I mean, it makes sense. I, I do believe this, by the way, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you already got the clientele. You know, Big Daddy Kane and Roxanne Shante were in his store buying furs. So he, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He was just thinking outside the box. If I'm selling furs, why can't I get in the rap game, dog? You know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> What was your thoughts about that, man? It seemed like you uh, feel some type of way. I already saw what this, you know, because I know a little bit of the history. So I just knew where this was going because, you know, this is early 90s, late 80s, where, you know, we, and I do mean we, we, the people who are the curators of the culture, are finally starting to be like, how should we be profiting off and managing it and having a little bit more control? 
but they ain't no Google. You know what I'm saying? They ain't no small business association to figure this stuff out. So, like, everybody's trying to figure this out. So his name was Andre in the show. Um, also, the fact he's played by Jamie Hector, who's one of the most underrated cast. If you've never watched The Wire, your life is lacking. My man, you know, I still know this dude. You know, I said as Marlo Stansfield, my name is my name. <laughs> Woo! So uh, I was super geeked, but then I was like, "Are oh, you gonna be the credit manager, dude?" Oh! Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but I liked it. I liked the role. I liked yeah. it. Yeah, um, yeah. You just felt the smarminess, you know, just and the inexperience. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I appreciated how they showed some of the story behind how they got picked up, you know, because I never knew some of it. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see, uh, just to tell us a little bit of the story about it. Uh, one of my favorite episodes, I mean, one of my favorite scenes is when they're in the record shop and they got the Denise, uh, oh, gosh, I forgot the name. I think Denise Williams, the Denise free Williams. joint. Yeah. Yeah. And Denise Williams. And it was like, we're going to make that be like, we're going to sample that record to do the Prince Rakim. I mean, to do like, oh, we love you, Rakim. Which I never... So it's one of the first kind of like remakes they... One of the few remakes in the show that they did. I was like, wow, this sounds great. And I wonder if that was supposed to really be the original. Do you know anything about that? Yes. I mean, you watched the next episode? So, yes. I, okay. Okay, so we get, we, we'll just stay in there. We'll just keep it there. Then. We'll yeah. There. So, even with seeing this episode, I was like, man, this choice Yo, sounds great. What that version is? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, we'll talk about that next episode. But, yeah, I trust me. Trust me. I felt the same way the first time I watched. I was like, do I know this version? Because it's not what I had. It's not what I remember. But okay, cool. Oh, yeah. my gosh. But with that said, I was just like, oh, yeah, that's right. He does have the single. I never heard the single. So after this episode, I heard the true release single, which I'm not going to lie. I'm still feeling. Okay. You know? Yeah. But it's a total different vibe. Totally different vibe. Totally different vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Them shopping in the radio and looking at stuff, like even the James Brown thing, that was a I love the fact that RZA did that because that is RZA. RZA is always trying to think outside the box. And I saw the lab because, of course, James Brown is one of the most sampled, <laughs> you know. You know, um, I don't even like Carla James Brown, the musician, you know. <laughs> one of the most sampled gods in hip-hop, you know. Usually, like, everybody, you know, you name them a rapper, and they sound, they, and they sell with James Brown. So it was cool that RZA was like, yeah, but so is everybody looking for James Brown samples. Let's do something else. Pretty so, much. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, the Funky Headhunter has been sampled so many times. So, yeah. So now I gotta, like, see what the Funky Headhunter is. I probably so have So when you, it. trust me, when you when you pull it up, you'll be like, oh, I've heard that break beat a lot okay. of times. Gotcha. A lot of times. So, yeah. <laughs> When you hear it, you'll be like, oh, that's that's that, that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah, that snare combination has been used a lot. Fed that up. Yeah. So anything else about the episode that you really enjoyed, man? The family moving out scene, we didn't talk a lot about that. Uh. So that was because first of all, I didn't think it was gonna happen that quickly. Okay. So like the last episode, you know, Jerome's like, I got this house in Ohio. I don't know. So this is a little pet peeve of mine. I feel the same way when you watch Belly and Nas is like, you're going to Africa. <laughs> it's like, are you going to Mozambique? Are you going to Madagascar? Are you going to Algeria? I, I, I do know that Africa is a whole continent. Ohio is a state. What I'm saying about it, I'm going to Ohio. Are you going to Youngstown? Are you going to Columbus? Are you going to Toledo? So like, I don't know why that bothered me so much. I was like, what, are they, what part of Ohio are they going to? You know? You think I didn't think it was really going. I didn't yeah, think it was gonna be real. They, exactly. So I didn't I didn't take it seriously. Yeah. So for see them pat on the truck, I'm like, oh, they really going. <laughs> Jerome wasn't joking. Oh, nah. they really going to Ohio. But just by then, I'm like, y'all packing up a truck, y'all still saying the state. Like, 
if you told me you were leaving leaving your city and you were like, yeah, man, we moving to Ohio, I probably let you say that twice before I go, what city? Oh, that's a, it's the state. <laughs> Pretty vague. Like, 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 think about it. Someone can't even tell they move to New York City. So I move to New York City, you'll be like, going to Manhattan, going to Yonkers, going to Staten Island. So the fact you're like, go to Ohio. That's like four metropolitan areas. I'm oh, sorry. Look, uh, look, I know that has nothing to do with the show. It just it bothered me, the fact that Ohio just kept being said. But yeah, like, them packing up. The fact that um, D-Love show, show gun on a crutch and they asked him to help him move. Help him, you know, I was fucking up with his shit. You know what I'm saying? But he's just a nice guy. You know, so the whole the whole crew showed up to help them move. Yeah, I was like, why are they really moving? And then, you know, I hate this plot, this plot point. Yeah. yeah. Sheree and D-Love, love letter stuff. I was like, oh gosh, like I hope this doesn't take too much of the episode. And it didn't. So it was cool. But yeah. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Um yeah. So that that was cool. Uh to go a little bit back to the to the, the um the shogun stuff. I think what really got me about the shogun stuff was that there's been a thread throughout this, a trend throughout this whole episode of young black men trying to find mentors. And whether it's Shah with uh, power, you know what I'm saying? It's it's Shogun and even um, Divine with Hayes. It, you have, you know, even um, Randy with Jerome. And now you're starting to see that Shogun also had, before he had Hayes, and they, they actually referenced Hayes late in the episode when, you know, when um Shogun's walking through uh Staten Island and sees Hayes, but the fact that he had this uncle that he really wanted to be that guy, and how the uncle just dropped the ball, and how the uncle kept saying, like, they robbing you, they robbing you. And it's because the uncle came back thinking he's gonna have his job back, and it was not his job anymore, and that 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 caused the relapse, the uncle's relapse. So I have something I picked up on is that there's been this trend of all of these young men um, seeking mentorship and how these mentors in a variety of ways have failed them or at least come up short. So that was something that I found really, really interesting. Piling on for Method Man, how traumatic those mentors have fallen. You know? Yeah, yeah, really good. Like, cause I think when you meet, like, no offense to some of the other characters, but Shogun, if you knew him, you'd be like, why you ain't doing better? Cause he just seems like even like how Shogun takes his job seriously at the at the Statue of Liberty and stuff like that. Shogun doesn't sell drugs. Uh, or doing anything like that. So Shogun's that guy in your life or friend or family member. He's like, dang, like, why ain't, why ain't this dude doing more? Like, why this dude couch surfing and stuff? Like, he seems dependable, seems respectful. And then you're like, oh, he had dramatic loss from two of his mentors. And, you know, they never mentioned a father. Obviously, his mother had some issues. So you like, they don't even touch on those relationships. So you like, this person's had a lifelong, um, a certain from lifelong trauma from departed mentors. And yeah. So let's not even forget <clears throat> this dude was playing lacrosse. So he probably went to a predominantly in Long Island. So in- they're doing it how it was. Met the man was living with family in Long Island, which had better opportunities. And then he um um moved to Staten Island. So, like, you, I don't know if you remember Dangerous Ground on up to Cal 2, Method Man. Because I thought Method Man was Staten Island. And then I remember hearing that song. He's like, Long Island, still in my heart, baby. Like, I'm like, oh, so this is showing the transition from Long Island to Staten Island. So, yeah. So, who knows what he went through being probably the only black dude or one of the few black dudes in the school? You saw what happened. Like, you know, some of that was, you know, the ref ain't going to call a hard foul on Bobby 
No, I shouldn't say it, Bobby. I'm um, Brent when he knocks you down. But you're not down Brent. You, you, you're in the penalty box because, you know, like you're not supposed to be playing this. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, man, he's gone through a lot, man, you know. And um, yeah, it made me kind of sentimental again towards your boy, man. You know, and a, and a good episode. It was a good episode. It was like episode. I keep saying. So, the, the hold on, like even the intro with the to and the lacrosse thing. I'm like, yo, like they have they reached they they really reaching their little groove. This these are two really good episodes back to back, and so I'm like, okay. still ain't better than Impossible. It ain't better. No, 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 no. Impossible definitely is the peak so far. But yeah. the fact that they didn't follow that up with some jump, and the fact this was also a very good episode. I think they have a good story. One because we love the Wu Tang. Yeah, they're giving us a good story around the Wu Tang, and I think that story is really the, what's the driving force behind all this. That makes sense. That you makes know what I'm saying? And I got to give them props to that man. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Are you ready to talk LVPs and MVPs in episode? Yeah, man. I'm ready to do it, man. I'm ready to do it, man. Go Who ahead, you? bro. You started off, dog. All right. You know, MVP, man, I'm going to give it to Young Method Man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, uh, I think Young Method Man helped me to see kind of like the difficulties that uh, Method Man had to go through, you know, probably early in his life. You know what I'm saying? In this Wu American saga you know, that kind of led to his reactions later on in his life. You know, it's it's a lot. You know what I mean? And um, I appreciate him trying to handle it the best way he knew how. Um, can't say it can't 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 say it was great. But, you know, when you have no structure, sometimes that's the thing. But it just helped me to put a more. It helped me to connect more with the character of yeah. Shogun or Method Man, as you want to call him. So that's yeah. my MVP. Okay. Who you got for your MVP, LVP. man? Oh, LVP. Man, it was it was a couple options here. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um uh, uh so the a standard option for me is Uncle Anthony, and that's Method Man's uncle when he showed up yeah. drunk to his championship game. Ah. <sighs> And he had to miss, like, the second half of the championship game, man. Like, you got to stand, like, especially for a kid who's playing a sport that he loves. Yes. And it's kind of like his, I guess, his ground to get some, it's kind of like his safe space in a sense, even though it's not as safe. Yeah, it is. No, it is. It is. Definitely it is. And then here you come and just interrupt that, and he has to be the man to kind of, handle the people like hey it's all right not get the cops because he understands the situation as uncle is off parole and he gets caught i mean that's just that's just a lot for a teenage kid to deal with and here you put him in that position it's just kind of like come on dude so he was my lvp of the episode i had somebody else but i think that's the main one i'm gonna go with you know what i mean (laughs) okay cool so i wanted you to go first because my MVP, i have the same mvp as you um, and that's I, I try to think of somebody else, but I couldn't. It, it's it's the Shogun. Um, it was his episode, and he shined. Dave yeah. Eves really did a great job. Um, he was involved in so many phases, even the moving thing. He was a part of that, and just how like it connected, like he, Dave even connected the moving to his life of how he had lacked stable state stability, but he was able to see it like wow, these people are moving together. It's, they're removing. But it's the stability there, and um, he was like, "Yo, my uncle taught me how to cross box, you know, how to how to box." And I'm like, "Oh, that's the, you know, so, ah." So that was that was heavy. So yeah, um, my MVP links up to my LVP. My LVP was that white exec at the club. Ah. <laughs> ah. Woo! I'm not about that one. I'm not about that. Yeah, that, I didn't even want to mention the club, so I was going to talk about it during this part. You know, Shogun handled himself the best way he could have. I think I would have done the exact same thing. I have I have definitely encountered that on the corporate side in a corporate way, you know, where you got this guy and he's like, hey, man, you know, he's like, yo, we want to sign you. And Shogun's like, cool, cool, cool. And uh, the Father MC shade was a little like, Ugh. are you familiar with Father MC? 
Uh, I've heard the name. So, so Father MC. So, okay. So, Big Big Daddy Kane was seen as the pretty boy rapper during that time. Yeah. Good reason. So, imagine Big Daddy Kane, but dancing even more and being even more pretty. That was Father MC. Okay. And the fact that I always compared them because Big Daddy Kane, Father MC. But Father MC made, you know, talented MC, but definitely more of a rapper and a lyricist. But like, but he had dark skin dude, high top fade. His was, I think, shaded. And he did a lot more dancing and stuff like that. He definitely was more pretty boy than Kane, which is hilarious because Kane is Kane did Kane did a, a spread for Playgirl. That's how pretty boy Kane was. So if I say somebody's more pretty boy than Kane, that says a lot. Uh, of course, Kane is a god. He can do whatever the hell he wants to. But um, yeah, the whole hey, it's better than slinging on the corner and going to jail. <laughs> Are you lucky to get two pieces? You know, so yeah, just that experience. Um, uh, that was hard. That was hard to, to witness. And, you know, the fact that everybody stared at, at Shogun like, oh my God, you gotta know how to act. You hear what this dude just told him? Right. And Shogun's right. I don't do any crimes. I literally don't slang. I work at the freaking Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I am not part of any of that. And it may have been a little bit of like, the dude you talking to, they what they, he does. You know, that's what Bobby does, okay? That's not me. So, yeah, man. Man, fuck that dude. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel, dog. Yeah, man, I just better than slanging on the corner and going to jail. <laughs> Oh my god, that definitely was a low point in the episode. It was like oh, robbed his ass. In the episode that had multiple low points, that was the low point. It was a lot. There was a lot of low points. <laughs> get kicked out, you get kicked out your house. <laughs> Uncle getting arrested. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Woo, I would have robbed him. <laughs> Debbie would have waited for him outside the club. Oops. Willie and Frito, we at the Willie and Frito show do not encourage felonious crimes of anything. I'm just saying, you know, it kind in of the context of the show. Of the show. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not going to jail. So we got a stern yeah. talking to from me. Stern talking to. Probably while wearing the woo. <laughs> just love how serious it is. <laughs> He's got, yeah, a to, huh? he got a wool mask on. He got a wool mask on. Gotta put the wool mask on. Let him know it's slightly dangerous in here. Slightly. <laughs> that's that's all I got, bro. Yo, man, I appreciate it, man. <laughs> Always good chopping it up. And to all our listeners out there, appreciate you listening to us. Uh, please go ahead and follow us on. All social media sites, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, all that jazz. And uh, appreciate y'all a lot. We out. Peace.